I know there's a few of you daring to attempt to leave the room, so please stay with us. We have a fabulous afternoon session and one I know you're going to be very, very interested in. We have um, a fascinating man who's going to spend the next 30 minutes with us, a gentleman who has done incredible work here in Dubai, and when you look around, you can see his handiwork probably all over the place. It's certainly among the biggest, the best, the tallest. Um, all of these will probably play into what this gentleman has been working on for many, many years here in the region. But he's also a man with a mission and he's expanding outside of this region. And he's really going to tell us what's been going on. That gentleman, of course, is the chairman of Imar. And only this morning, the Imar Malls launched on the stock exchange, that IPO that opened 20% up. So uh, you can imagine he might just have a few spare dirhams to invest in Africa. So maybe he'll tell you a little bit about that. But more importantly, he's working on many projects here in the region and indeed in Africa. His focus has truly moved to that continent where he himself says he doesn't feel like a foreign investor. Please give a very warm welcome. We're going to hear from him for just a few minutes and we'll put him on the hot spot here. You will have an opportunity to talk to him and ask him some questions. He is a board member of Eagle Hills. Please welcome Mohammed Alabar. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it's such a great pleasure to, uh, to be able to come and join you and have a chat with you. Um, you know, if I were to tell uh, someone about the story of investing in Africa, I don't think they will get it unless I go back 18 years and I share with them investing in Imar. Because I tell uh, to a lot of uh, uh, institutions who are in New York and who are in London, possibly in Singapore, I tell them that if I came to you in 1997 and I said, you know, we are in the Middle East, very unstable. We are the source of bad news in the world. And by the way, I'm launching a public company that will go into the real estate business. I don't think anybody will give me any money. And I don't blame them as well. Because 1997, there is so much going on in the Middle East and still so much going on in the Middle East, unfortunately. But if you know your business well, if you are passionate enough, if you are in love enough, determined enough every single morning, you wake up one day, like today, which is a historic day, and suddenly from 97 to now, you created this monster that has a value of about 40 billion US. Right? <laughs> Now, I know, I know institutional investors in the world, they will tell you corporate governance is an issue, you know, transparency is an issue, maybe corruption is an issue, infrastructure is an issue, clarity is an issue, no democracy, will tell us all that. And you know something? They are right. But we are growing nations, we have to start somewhere. We need to go up somewhere. And you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but we don't want to talk too much about corruption. But you know, in the Western world, you just get a consultant, high powered, connected, they'll sort things out for you. They call them the lobbyist, right? So I'm saying, give our region a chance. We are not that bad. We try, we make it sometimes, we fail sometimes, but we know one thing. Our region, when I say our region, I'm talking about Africa and the Middle East. We need everything. We need roads, we need schools, we need restaurants, we need hotels, we need apartments, we need parks, we need infrastructure, we need logistic centers, we need airports. I mean, my friends who use Lagos Airport, they realize we need airport, right? But that's okay. That's how we start and we have to move on. And really, when I visit Africa and I've, I've gone to the most exciting places in Africa, including La Mumbashi in DRC, which is the most exciting 
down for me. You know that the world is moving. There is growth. There is risk. But God has given us enough IQ that we manage risk. That we have enough IQ to say, I can take this risk. And if it goes bad, I can still stand. And you have to work hard. One of the things that we should do day and night to minimize risk, work very, very hard. There is no shortcut. No shortcut. Don't think you're going to sit in Dubai. You would love to have a meeting in Paris and you want to do business in Lagos. Go to Lagos, my friend. And I tell all my friends in the Middle East, I said, you know, guys, you would love to go to London. Have a meeting in London, have a meeting in Zurich, have a meeting in Paris. No way. You have to go to Abuja, Lawanda, right? Mozambique, Uganda. Okay, flights are problems. Flies are a problem. Hotels is a problem. But that's where the opportunity exists. You want to live on a 3% return? Go to London and go to the USA. You want to do the big stuff? Come to the Middle East, come to Africa. Right? So, and you know, honestly, I'm really speaking from my heart. I've been to these cities. I've seen people. I've seen infrastructure. Honest to God, I've never been treated like an investor. They treat me like a friend. They, I, mean, I mean, I think the super people in Africa are so welcoming. Now, bureaucracy? Of course. You have to know your way around? Of course. I have to know my way around Saudi Arabia. I have to know my way around in Egypt. But you have to work hard, we said, right? Is it just, I mean, if it happens automatically, then everybody is going to make it. No way. You have to find your way. You have to go once, twice. I cannot tell you how many times I've been to Lawanda. Nothing happens. Nothing. It has been two years. It's happening now. And happening big. But I like to do that. So I'm, I'm so grateful that I, that I get the chance to do what I do, to see the people I see. And I'm, I'm so grateful to so many people who, who helped me along the way. And I learned so much, especially when I go to all these wonderful places in, in, in Africa. Harare, of course, is one of the most incredible cities for me. And, you know, I, I love Zimbabwe so much. You know, to a point when one day I thought I'll buy a house in Zimbabwe. It was so beautiful. You know, Africa is so beautiful, really. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to sit down and have a chat. But all I would like to tell you is that the simple fact is that in 20 years, somebody can own many companies worth $30 billion in Africa. We have to start now. Thank you. Well, I think if you ever give up the day job, you'll have a, a job as a motivational speaker, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, and we'll be all looking like, for I, the... I think there'll be a problem with pay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be looking for the book called The Alibar Way, a man who obviously many might think is lucky, but uh, you've you. worked very hard to create this luck. Thank you so much. And on a day like today, too, with um, our stock exchange listing this morning, to a big congratulations, Thank I think, so much. from everybody. So a little added Thank you. congratulations Thank you so to you for that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. As you said, it didn't happen overnight. You've been working very yeah, hard on it, yeah. and you've been creating it, making it happen. And again, you want to replicate that now outside of Dubai. It's not that you're getting bored here, but um, you're also looking at other horizons. Tell us a little bit, we've seen some of the plans that you have out there, particularly for um, the operation in Abuja. And that one you did with uh, literally a little bit of good luck by your side. Yeah, huh? yeah there we go. There we That's go. Uh, a joint venture, I believe, with the Nigerian government. Yeah. Um, and it's a very ambitious looking plan. Yes. And having been in Abuja many times, it's a, a very different looking model than uh, one has seen, I think, for a while there. How important is that, and why are you building that city? Well, of course, I think everybody knows that uh, Nigeria is really the, the largest economy in, uh, in Africa, and you have, you know, uh, you've got the population base as well. And, uh, and good growth, about 6.5 percent. Yes, good growth. They've got, they've got uh, infrastructure deficiencies, and the government is, uh, is very supportive. So it's about 2,000 acre site um, where it's just been licensed as a free zone. Uh, the uh, land is owned by uh, an investment company, so we, all, we invested in the, in the land owning company, but 
we are the, inv the main investor in the infrastructure of the whole development uh, based on uh, we invest and we collect X percentage of profit uh, from, the, from the deal. Um, and again, you're starting this project off. One of the other landmarks within it will be an address hotel. Um, yes. That's just one of the things that's there. And Abuja, if any place, desperately needs a five-star hotel. I've been to many of the five-star hotels in Abuja, and believe me, uh, I think it will be certainly welcomed. But yeah. you're building also, um, you know, the parks around there. You're also looking at this too as being a smart city. How can you actually manage to do that? I mean, again, there's power issues in Abuja. I actually yeah. did an oil and gas conference recently, and the lights went out. The power in a conference like this just failed yeah. in the city. Yeah, so sure. hopefully by the time you're built, the power will be sorted. But that's got to be a problem. Well, again, you know, we, we also, you know, I don't come from Southern California where electricity is there all the time. I come from the Middle East. So my project in Egypt have a standby power. My project in Lebanon has standby power. So I'm used to the standby power business, which is not very strange. Nigeria will have problem with power. They could solve it after four years. They could solve it after 10 years. But you plan for that. You price it into your project and see if the numbers make sense. Do you think the mentality sometimes of people from this region um, and from the Middle East, you know, blends well to actually doing business in Africa because, you know, you, you know these obstacles. And again, you're not coming from California thinking it should all be happening and it should all be switched on and ready to go immediately. So you anticipate the obstacles perhaps a little bit better yeah. than other investors from the other side of the world. I, I don't know. Well, first of all, I, I love Southern California for your information. <laughs> this is my spot for my, my summer holiday because it's the best place on earth. Uh, but, but I really think if you are European, Italian, I have some Italian investors in Nigeria with us, it depends on your state of mind. Are you a positive person to say, I can see all the obstacles in Nigeria or in Uganda, I can see the poor infrastructure, my God, this thing will only go one way. So it depends on who is there on the table. Um, so I would say European can do well, I would say Middle Eastern can do well, it just depends on who you're dealing with. Now the your brand has always been associated with, with high quality as well. So you're not selling these um, houses and villas. and This is, is very much upscale. And you're bringing in a very different level of investment into the area. Who's, the, who's going to buy there? And you look at Nigeria at the moment. Um, are you looking at the big cash buyers, only the top tier of society? Um, because it's not an easy place to get a mortgage. Well, on, on our first phase, which is our uh, apartments and our uh, 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 villas, we're definitely going to the uh, upper, middle, upper market uh, on purpose. That's part of our strategy. But when you have a 2,000 acre site, without a doubt, you really need to mix it upper with upper, middle, middle income because you're just so large. Uh, I would say in Africa, I would like to go with the middle, upper, middle in general. So Nigeria is one country you've actually broken ground on. This is a yeah. project that started. So for you, there's no stopping on this project. Yes, um, There might be a few obstacles along the way, but correct. you don't foresee that it will be stalled along the way. The commitment is there, the money is there. Um, is, is that that's a project that's going to go full steam ahead? Yes, exactly. The project is moving moving forward. But you are right. You know, you will be dealing bureaucracy. You'll have you'll have issues. I had them in Dubai. I had them in, in Saudi Arabia. And a possible change of government very quickly. Yeah, yes, but but you know, you have you have to move forward and get ready for these obstacles, and you have to you know you have to go on. Another big success story has been your work in Egypt, and that's a country you feel also very passionate about in terms of the efforts that you put in there and the projects you've built. Tell us a little bit more about that. We in the Middle East, uh, in general, I would say especially the Gulf countries, you know, we, we are really very territorial. So, uh, for example, if you, are, if you are in Nigeria or if you are, uh, if you are from Kampala, say, in Uganda, you know, you invest only in Kampala. You know, any, any other city is a little strange for you. So we in Dubai, we are we're very comfortable with investing in Dubai. I know the mayor, I know all the bureaucrats, life is easy, if there is a problem, I can pick up the phone and go see his highness, he'll solve my problems, so it's easy. Once you get out of your comfort zone, which is typical, right, we're human beings, then shoes come up. So when I started Egypt, a lot of people are critical of Egypt, and, and I don't blame them. A lot of people tried, it didn't work, uh, bureaucratic and it, process. I mean, it's had its, it's, it's too many problems, yes, very visible yes. problems. People ask me, I said, in Egypt, I really haven't had any problems. <laughs> I, oh, well, there's a bureaucratic, bureaucratic process. It's only natural. Of course, there's bureaucracy. Of course, it's a bit tough. 
But if business was easy, then you know, why should they hire me? Well, you don't need me, you just bring little junior guys and they'll get the job done. Uh, now, did I have a problem with my partner? Of course we had a problem with our partner in Egypt. We had a few months of, you know, hassle. We bought him out, we gave him some money and we, went, we all went goodbye. But with all the trouble that Egypt gone through, two years we didn't do much work. Including the two years, our seven-year-old investment is 700% up. 700. With two years of political problems. How are we doing the first six months? We are 40% up. The company is going to go public probably in June. Uh, you know, with a wonderful value, maybe three billion, three to four billion US. So this is serious money, serious country. Uh, growth is good, margins is go are good. Now, can we really expect all the trouble that might come on the way? No, but we manage our business. We take a bit of risk uh, in there. There is risk, can we manage risk? And we have to move forward. And the numbers definitely speak for themselves. When you look at that risk pro um, profile right across Africa um, and taking sort of the bird's eye view that you look at the countries that you're going to perhaps cherry pick and decide where to go, because you're not in all countries. Correct. Um, let's look at some of the ones that have really been attractive to you and tell us why. Um, U Uganda, what are you doing there and what are you intending to do? Well, Uganda, uh, mainly uh, real estate. So got a, we're negotiating on a very large uh, site in, in the middle of Kampala. And, and again, friendly government. Uh, we're going through the process of the land acquisition, which has taken a year, but we are almost there. Very sizable and we like size because, because we create our own little kingdom. In that, in that area, uh, growth is, uh, is going well, stability relatively good, uh, welcoming government. Uh. So, so what makes you decide? What do you look at, the people you talk to? You obviously do your due diligence and you yeah. look at these areas. Um, you have your various meetings and probably many of them, as you said, sometimes for two years and sure. nothing happens yes. and then sure. it happens. So, but what is it? Is it? Does it start with maybe a gut instinct that you think, look at what's going on and just do not quite your, maybe your own metrics in terms of what's going to make this work. What says to you this is going to work? Well, the truth is that you know, at the beginning, I really visited everywhere. I was in Mali, I was in Niger, I just gone everywhere. I just I want to look, I want to enrich my eyes. But at the end of the day, the numbers should talk. So where is, where is the size in Africa? We know it's in Lawanda, we know it's in Lagos, we know it's in Ghana, we know it's in, in, uh, uh, in Maputo. Uh, we know possibly that it is in, in Uganda, so uh, possibly uh, uh, Ethiopia. And I said, listen, I can't do everything, but let me just focus on the major cities in Africa. Now, we could differ in opinion, what's major, why would you do this, not do that? So I thought that these are really the cities that we can, we can do business in. They have the right size. We think that the, uh, the economy is doing well, the government is friendly, relatively clean to deal with. And we said, fine. Now, we could have gone to, uh, you know, probably Ethiopia should have been included. But I think personally, just I didn't have the right contact. So I was a little late. I'm not late today. And we probably have a few good contacts for you here. I do want to let you know that at any time, please, if you want to ask a question, we do have a few microphones, I believe, in the room. Um, I don't have my iPad here, so I think... Uh, if anybody actually wants to take this opportunity to ask a question, please be sure and let us know. Um, talk to me about Guinea. You went into Guinea probably for a different reason when you were looking at your mineral business too, but you tend to get lured back into real estate. Yeah, Is that I know, it? I know. Yeah, I started in Africa really uh, just mining, so I was quite active in Guinea, which is, uh, you know, um, Conakry is a beautiful city. And and I kept visiting other cities to talk about my mineral business. And then everybody pulls me back after the meeting when I talk about real estate. Everywhere I go, people talk about real estate. So I said, listen, why should I fight it? You know, everybody wants to give me 300, 400 hectares and acres right in the heart of cities. I run the numbers, they look quite decent. Uh, and you know, concession of all these uh, minerals are long term stuff. So I focused Guinea where, you know, uh, iron ore, you know, gold and, and, uh, and alumina. And the rest, I just focused on the real estate because it became such a huge uh, 
profile and, and that's where I'm going now. So have you given up on the, the mining prospects in Africa? No, the company's still operating, but I'm focused only in Guinea because that's really a rich country. So the focus is there. Uh, on and Guinea again, there, bauxite, bauxite, iron ore. Uh, so um, bauxite, iron ore, gold, got a little bit of diamond, but the rare earth as well. And a lot of that um, raw material then heading where? Towards India, towards well, China. Again, really, as we, as you know, we are almost done of all of all of our uh, w site work. Then it's really up to the up to the purchasers. You know, if you'll be selling to traders or you'll be uh, bulk buyers. I mean, on the alumina, it could be it could be email that, that will come and will sign a long-term contract with you. So it's really open. But so definitely, India is coming up, and, and I have no doubt that uh, that China is going to come back. They're fixing their house, but they will come back. Now you talk also about the, the triangle of trade that there is, you know, from the regions in Africa yeah. through Dubai in terms of being a trading port and heading towards that the big demand is still coming out of India and China. And there also you're doing your own business as well as the real estate. So it's not just Africa. You're doing a lot of work in India as well, I believe. Well, in India, of course, the majority of our work is, is real estate. We are the second largest uh, player in India uh, at this stage. But on the minerals, I think Dubai will be one of the main hubs I mean, look at the diamond business that comes through uh, Dubai uh, from Africa. So I think other minerals will probably do the same, have the same. Now, I know earlier you mentioned you didn't want to talk about the, uh, you know, the, the question that we don't ever want to talk about when we talk about Africa. Um, but uh, we've listened to many people today talking about the transition of the economy and the fact that there is more transparency coming on board. It's not right yet, and nobody is saying that it's perfect in, in any area. You did compare it to the, the Mr. 10 percent for the lobbying groups and that. But is that moving fast enough in terms of the legal structures, the transparency within these countries that make you more encouraged to go in there and do business? What I see is that it's really moving fast. I mean, thanks to Twitter and Facebook, I mean, everybody is trying so hard to do the right thing. <laughs> and is everybody but, at the exposed? but at the same time, I think people are more educated. They're demanding more transparency becoming so obvious and governments are trying hard but at the same time this change cannot be an overnight change so I would say I'm, I'm really happy I think things are really going uh, the right direction will you ever eliminate the so-called corruption I don't think so when you do favors it's corruption so I think I think we have not been very fair to the Middle East and to Africa Honestly, I think we should give people a break, uh, let them grow. They, these are growing pains. It will get better and better all the time. Uh, now, you can have a really wonderful democracy like India, where nothing moves, and they can build a bridge. <laughs> um, I know, I'm not saying I'm, f I'm for it. I'm saying, let's be reasonable. Things do take time. You, you just can't. You have, you have a bunch of uneducated farmers, and suddenly they are experts on democracy. They don't know what they're voting on. Come on. We know that, right? So when you need yeah, so things moved on a little bit, it's always good I'm to be able to talk I to see the man with the key. I think it's really looking good. I think there is a lot of pressure on government to behave, which is wonderful. But let's take it easy on these people. Give them, give them a chance. They are changing. They are moving. But they just came from a little uh, hut. Suddenly, you want this guy to know how to deal with a, with a downtown Abuja. Easy on the guy, you know? Do you, do, you, do, you think, do you think that the governments there are becoming almost, you know, they are becoming more aware, they're becoming absolutely, that the people are absolutely. critical around the world, and absolutely. they're almost maybe self-censoring and beginning to pay a lot more attention than perhaps they did five, ten years so. ago? I think so, and then all these populations, they are the biggest users of Facebook and Twitter, by the way, because they don't have much to do, not like the West. The West, they've got, you know, they play volleyball, they go mountain climbing, they go... But these poor guys, they have nothing except Twitter, so they're really active, and they know what's going on, and they repeat stories. So, you know, we pol politicians are really in big trouble. They need to behave quickly. <laughs> Now, we see the move um, from rural areas in Africa into the cities and the tremendous growth of the cities. But again, we see that right around the world. But I think particularly in Africa, many people saying that really the biggest cities, many of them in the world, are going to be in Africa in the next 20 years. Yes. You want to be a part in building those cities. And you also talk about building smarter cities. Is this, again, an environment that's ready 
to go with smarter cities. We heard from some of the telecoms operators sure. that, you know, that has advanced. As you said, everybody is, you know, they've got internet access now. But bringing that sort of final mile to people, are, is, it, is it ready for that next yeah. step? Well, of course, the biggest coming cities in the coming 15 years are the Chinese cities, which will swallow all, all cities in the world. Uh, but I, I, I feel that the, the African cities are really trying. Some will do it better than others, but they're really trying. They want to do the right thing. And again, are you, as a government, want to do the right thing? Yes, right uh, initiative, but are you doing it with company X, company Y, because you've got company X who's really serious about doing the business, you've got company Y who want to do quick $2 and move on. So who's your partner as well? I mean, it's the blame is on the private sector as well, is that we also have to behave. We have to do right. We have to do well. You know, we, I can't blame the government for everything. I have to blame the private sector to be responsible, to act well and act yeah. right. We heard from many speakers today, too, talking about the, the lack of financing and capital flows into Africa, particularly to help the small to medium-sized business. Obviously, the more of these businesses there are, the more people that are going to be around to buy your property. Sure. What can you say to these people, perhaps, to advise them in terms of you know, how they move the next step in business and what should they be doing? I will, I will go back to the 1997 when I started. It's the same thing. You know, it's difficult to, to get debt. Right. 17, 18 years ago, that's exactly the same what you see in, in Africa. But I think these economies evolve and, and you know, entities, they do better business, smaller businesses, they do better and they, and, and they also learn because it's not only that I'm a middle, you know, middle sized organization. A lot of people are beginners in business. They're not sophisticated enough to deal with the business. So that's what I'm saying. I think we forget that sometimes. Yeah, we do. We do. And I think we get, that's why I say give people time to grow. Some will grow fast. Some will grow and collapse and get up again. So it's just a natural process. And as I said, governments are trying. The private sector is freer to do more business. And that's, and that's wonderful. And as these countries come into, you know, the international regulatory environment too, is there a danger that uh, perhaps over-regulation might actually hold them back at times. Is there a danger of that at all? I don't know. I mean, the, com the countries that I deal with in the Middle East and in Africa, they're already over-regulated, honestly. So I think you will see probably more liberal regime of regulation in my, in my views. And I'll give you just an example. I think most Middle Eastern con countries and, Arab con and, and African don't have a mortgage, mortgage law, mortgage process. So, so we, have, we have, they have so much to do to liberalize, to organize, and I think it's going to happen. Now we might have time for maybe one or two questions. One question probably I can take. Um, there's a few people here, so perhaps if we take these two questions together, um, because uh, this half hour has actually just flown by. So if we can be very quick and direct. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yeah, hello. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just wanted to know if you believe that Africa growth will be built by Africans. Uh, there's a tendency of looking for outside instead of looking for Africa, even foreign direct investment. We are not promoting in any African country, we are promoting between Africa, Asia, Europe, and China. And the iron of it is, we don't trust on each other. OAU, we have talked about intra-African trade. What about intra-African investment? So why are we looking outside instead of inside? Even tourism. We are promoting tourism with Europe, Asia, and others, but no tourism in the domestic market, neither in other African countries. Super. We've only so got if we don't believe in mm -hmm. ourselves, we cannot wait for other nations to build Africa. Well, if you're Africa not looking for outside investment, you must be the only country in the world that's not. Um, because I think just about everybody is welcoming um, investment from outside. We've only got a few minutes on this. What can Africa do internally to really move itself to well, the next step. It's simple. If you were to come and look at what's happening in Dubai, for example, 90% of 95% of the investment is from the local business entities investing in Dubai because they know their country, they know the environment, they know the business much better. If you look at Lagos, who's investing in Lagos? The Nigerians. Who's investing in Maputo? The people of Maputo. So I'm trying to say that I think the idea of promoting foreign investment, we have to do that. We have to make sure that we are open to the world. But it's going to be a fact. Majority of your investment, I'm in Egypt, I'm in Cairo, for example. I am one.
but actually 80% of the investment in my sector is all by Egyptian companies. In India, the same. But I think just bringing investors in, I think it enhances the, the growth potential to move forward, but it will always be, majority will be people from within that country. Now, if the government goes and liberalize rules and make it easy, I promise you the local people will be the first people to take advantage of that because they know the environment, they know the rules, they know the risk level, and they do much, much better that way. It will happen. It's an automatic thing. And again, I think African countries want to put themselves on the international map and yeah. be an international player yeah, just and, and like anybody else. Another example in Egypt, you know, we are large in Egypt. All of our staff are Egyptian. Our CEO, everybody, the work they do in Egypt, maybe it's better than Dubai. So I don't want anybody to think that, oh, I go to Lagos or I go to Istanbul and I'll bring in my expertise. No, no, no. There is enough intelligent, passionate people in all of these countries. I've tried it in 11 countries. My operation in India, totally Indians. So it's only natural. And you're there to lend a helping hand. We have time for um, a few more questions. So we've been granted a little bit of a, a dispensation as it's, it's not that easy to get hold of Mr. Alabar. So we're very no, lucky to I'm, have him I'm here. here. So here. I can take one or two more questions. And um, uh, you have the microphone there. Please to uh, that lady, whoever, Yes, I think that lady who's there. I think I cannot make a question about Mr. Muhammad. I just have to say, you have moved me in this room, and your words are going to be my Bible to go to Africa and to the emerging market where I am today. Yeah, you Thank should. you so much. You See, there you are, Thank we told you. 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 Um, the <laughs> Alabar way. <laughs> Thank you. Please, we have another question down here. Um, and we do have a few roving microphones. If you can grab the eye of the lady with the microphone, you'll be doing it quicker. Oh, Thank Muhammad. you, sir. Hi, Mohammed. Um, you mentioned earlier that you really liked Zimbabwe. Um, yes. I'm very interested to know as to what you really like about Zimbabwe. I personally also have a great interest and I believe there's plenty of opportunity in Zimbabwe. What's, you know, what do you like about the country? Well, first of all, I love their beef. <laughs> the so best. you're fed well when you oh, go yeah, there. I it's tell very you, the important. best steak in the world is in Zimbabwe. I love the weather in Zimbabwe and I like how low the sky is because when you land and you get out of the plane, you say, my God, why is the sky so low? Because you're so high. The weather is so wonderful. I think people are so educated in Zimbabwe. Now, I have, I have, no, I have no understanding of the political scene in Zimbabwe and organization and, and what's working, what's not working. But you know, mineral resources in Zimbabwe is unbelievable. Agriculture is unbelievable. Water is unbelievable. Uh, so, but it just, you know, somebody got to put this thing together and somebody got to say, listen, you know, people can invest. These are the rules uh, and you can move uh, forward. I tried, it was a little tough, uh, many visits, but I said, you know what, maybe it's not the right time. But at least I, at least I saw Harari, I, I understand Zimbabwe, which is, you know, enriching. Uh, for me. And again, these are all places that you might well go back to. As an investor and as a businessman, can you actually stay out of politics when you go to these countries? I mean, you obviously at sometimes have to have yeah. the rubber stamp from the government or from a ministry, um, but for the most part, can you separate business and get on with what you're doing and make your returns um, and, and be it a win-win situation for everyone? Well, the answer is probably yes and no. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Middle East. It's the diplomatic I answer, yes no, and I deal, no. No, I, no, I'll tell you, yes. I, deal, I deal with, with yeah. uh, politics all the time. I was dealing with one regime in Egypt uh, that's gone. Uh, I was under full scrutiny by, by the Morsi government. Open file, we have, we've done, done nothing wrong. All went well. Uh, now, so what I'm saying is that there are governments where sometimes the regime will change. Sometimes the regime will change and there is no harm, but I think it's your duty to make sure that you do business and make sure that the local government help you, make sure you stay clean in your business because no matter what, one government is in after five years, another government will come in and you have to make sure that you know, whatever business you do is, is a clean business and, and you, know, you don't offend anybody and you don't cross uh, any line. Uh, any line. Are you, you have to get involved in politics and you have to understand people, build relationships, so at least you can get your business going. We have a question from a gentleman over here on the right, sir. Dr. Abdul Latif from uh, Nigeria, busy in Saudi Arabia and Malaysia. I have 
problem here regarding the culture between, be, between Middle East and Africa. How can, can this be solved? Well, I, uh, I think, uh, you know, for us, for example, you know, we people from the United Emirates, we have a culture issue with our brothers in Egypt. You know, so I think I'll just say this. I'm an investor. I come to your country. I'm a guest. I have to respect your culture. I have to respect the way you do business. And I should not, you know, uh, moan too much. Is that, oh, this is not moving fast. That's not done right. It's your country. If I don't like the way you do business, I should go back to my own country. So I think you should be polite. <laughs> no, you know, it's... So we do have to, to wrap it up at this stage, Thank but you. give us your final thoughts in terms of the, the future of a continent that you embraced many, many years ago and you got a head start there. Yeah. What do you say to perhaps other investors that talk to you sure. and realize you've taken that risk that it has worked for you in some areas um, and some others perhaps not? You know, what, what's the next step for you and what would you share with other people to go I'd ahead? Ra I'd rather go back. I lived seven years in Singapore till 1991. And I've seen the progress in Singapore over the seven years. When I came back to Dubai in 1992, I saw Dubai like Singapore 15 years back from Singapore, or, or 11 years, 12 years. And I had a bet on the real estate sector. And I said, this city has to grow. So my bet did work. I see exactly the same thing in Africa, as if I've moved from Dubai to Africa, and I see there is a gap of 15 years, 20 years, whatever you want. And you say, listen, this is going to move now. Some cities will move 6% a year, 7%, 5%, but definitely it's going that direction with, with of course, uh, population base, young population, natural resources, you know, proactive government. So that's, that's the only thing I would like to tell you that. It's that comparison that you have to keep in mind. So, you know, be optimistic, but yes. plan well and, yes. and calculate that risk. And, and make sure you can handle the risk. Yes. Make sure you can take a risk to say, listen, if this goes bad, I can stand. And then try really hard. <laughs> and work thank hard. You. We leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mohammed Alibar, thank, thank you, you so much for taking nice the time. We're absolutely thrilled. Thank you so much. So thank it's been great to have you here. Thank and, you once again, congratulations on the IPO today, Thank you and so much. hopefully we'll be hearing more and more of, of course, that, of perhaps with an African flavor, even in a few of years' course, time. Of course. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm staying. She's staying. She'll take you. <laughs>